I'm Jennifer Biggs with the Daily Memphian. Chris Harrington is sitting across the table from me, and this is Fun Bites. Today, we're going to be talking about all the things we've missed in the last week. You can find current and past podcasts of Sound Bites at DailyMemphian.com. Listen to it on WYXR 91.7, your crosstown radio at 11 a.m. on Thursdays. Go to DailyMemphian.com to find my food and dining stories, Chris's food and dining stories, and lots of good stories from other journalists at the Daily Memphian. Find our Table Talk group on the Daily Memphian's Facebook page. Chris, hi. Hey, we're back. We're back in the in the same room. It's been a while. We are. Well, you were out one week, and then I was out the next week. So yep. it has been a while, hasn't it? Yeah. The oh, that's right. <laughs> Eric and I had that disaster of a podcast, and then you went and professionally did a real podcast on the air. You did it live. I, I last did week. it on the air. We had uh, hopefully people listened to that last week. We had a little bit of a. We ended up having to do it live on radio just for, mm-hmm. for scheduling reasons. And the transfer from radio to pod usually goes the other way. We're recording in the pod studio and it transfers to radio. The transfer the other way, we somehow lost the first minute, which is just me explaining who I was and who the guest was and why you weren't there. But hopefully people were able to get past that. I had a nice talk with Meredith Clinton, chef of various endeavors, most recently the speakeasy that just opened last week. I think that she is just really interesting. No, reading, enjoyed, I've only met her briefly, but read, you've been writing about her, and I think well, she sounds great. Yeah, it, it was a fortuitous coincidence because I had interviewed her earlier in the year when she, they did the pop-up um, there at 409 South Main. They did the CCC, pop, CCC pop-up restaurant for a few weeks that was all food started with the letter C, champagne, caviar, chicken. Chicken. You know, cheeseburgers, whatever, um, corn dogs. So I'd enjoy talking. I wrote a story about that. I really enjoyed talking to her. And then I came back to town with you being gone and Natalie saying, hey, are you doing a pod this week and not not have any idea what to do? And I looked on our site and what do you know? There was a story with a new thing this woman was doing and I already knew her and she had her in my phone. And, and, and so it was an easy thing to, to do. I'm glad I was very thankful she, she agreed to do it. But no, I, I was interesting. You always want to talk to people about their new endeavor because mm-hmm. they're there to promote that. But what I enjoyed was getting sort of off topic with her and talking about how she made potato logs at her at her you know father's gas station growing up and that right. kind of stuff. Well, Eric and I did nothing but get off topic. We got so far <laughs> right. off topic, we don't even know where we ended up. It was just some kind of wild, uh, you know, train. We we had a plan. And the plan went out. No, I was with you. I'll come to your defense on this because your point, which I understood completely, was that that people reflexively think change is always bad, and it is not always bad. I was correct. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. You have my back. I wish you had been there. Natalie and Eric mocked me mercilessly for that, showing that the the worst situation can become a honeypot of a deal the next day. No, I think think your general point is a good one, and I think it's an important one for Memphis in that I do think we have too much, especially long time Memphians have too much of a, of a no reflex to things, which doesn't mean that all change is good because all change is not good. That's true, and and, and, and I think you look around Midtown, there's reason to question a lot of stuff that's happening. But there is a reflex of resistance to change, I think, I think is worth noting. Yeah. For instance, my cat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to tell the sad story of my old cat who has gone blind. We, we don't have to talk about that change. But, but hey, bad. here's hey. a segue. While things are changing in Midtown, something that has not changed is the beauty shop. Oh, gosh. You know what? I have always loved the beauty shop. In fact, I don't think there's any food that Karen has made over the years that I haven't liked. Karen Carrier, of course, is who we're right. talking about. Beauty shop turns 20. It's actually 20. It turned 20 in July. But they wanted to have the party when they could get Harlan T. Bobo back for right. – <clears throat> the big shindig that's going to be Saturday night. And her food, not just her food. Her food is creative and it's fun and it always has been, whether it's been at Beauty Shop or whether it was down at Automatic Slims. Right. I remember the first time I ever made, ate at Automatic Slims and had the voodoo stew, which is kind of what the Lucky Pot is now at Beauty Shop. It was just like, you know, hope, opening a whole new world of food to me. It was So wonderful. she opened Automatic Slims downtown, what, it was late 90s? Nine, like 91. Okay, midnight. Okay. It was, yeah. For me, it was late 90s because that's when I moved back after right. college. That was like when we first moved back as young adults to Memphis, post-college, that was like my favorite place. Oh, yeah. And, and when she opened it, there was hardly anything here. There was, I mean, downtown. Right. You think about uh, restaurants that were operating, there was basically the rendezvous. I mean, it was mostly just kind of dark downtown um, that early in the 90s. The Peabody had reopened, but it hadn't been reopened, what, maybe? I mean, it reopened 
early to mid 80s yeah, maybe like 85, 80, 86, 80, 86 something like that maybe a little earlier but not yeah. much earlier if if earlier at all um so it was um she did take a big chance by going downtown, but it was good because a lot of people, of course, then, you know, downtown, of course, is a, a thriving restaurant scene now. Even with, you know, COVID ravages, it's still a, a pretty good deal. But here's the thing to me that I think is so easy, uh, people might overlook. I think that Karen is just herself critical to the Memphis restaurant scene. I think she is. As important, if maybe not more important, than, say, Justine Smith was 50 years ago. And a, a very different type of person, but a big personality. Justine had that. I mean, you know, she was always, she was around in her restaurant. She would come down the staircase. I mean, she had a way that the restaurant was presented. You you may be too young. To, did you ever even go to Justine's? No, I'm familiar, but I never right. went there. I mean, I didn't go very often either. I think I've only went twice because, right. again, it was not – it's been closed for almost 25 years. But she – but her personality was that larger-than-life kind of thing at the, the same the same way Karen is, but a very different kind of personality than Karen's. Karen's is funky and fun and artistic and uh, – Well, I think – and you and you, your story brings this out. You talk about, you know, her – you know, she's from Memphis and then the young adult experiences in New York – and it seems to me what sh- she brought a kind of a, a, a kind of boldness and a kind of experience of other places and sort of the idea of fusing Memphis with experiences outside of Memphis and that sort of level of create creativity. I think, you know, in recent years, and when I say recent, I'm talking about like the last, you know, 15, 20 mm-hmm. years, we think of that generation of Andrew Michael and Kelly English and those sort of those that, that sort of generation that sort of changed Memphis dining. And like Karen Carrier really preceded that was sort of like uh, maybe like the canary in the coal mine in a way to, in terms of modernizing like the Memphis dining scene a little bit. Well, I you think. know, that's that's very true. And it, it, if you look back even, I've, and I've, I've done this timeline before, but I don't have it right in my head now. But you can look at it in sort of a cyclical thing that, OK, so you had these chefs in these years. You had Erling coming here, and right. right what when? At late eighties, maybe was when uh, Erling came to. I could be wrong a little bit, but that was you know La Terrell. Uh, right, Glenn Hayes ended up bringing Erling here around the same time that Karen was uh, getting started. Jose was here uh, down into Peabody, um, but he you know he was a food and wine best new chef. So he had this early kind of this vanguard coming in and taking away from. The old restaurants, right, like right, right. you know, the Justines and the uh, Four Flames and the Embers, which I don't even remember ever stepping in the Embers. I don't think I ever went in there. But well, here's here's what I think is different. I think th- those places are more traditional, more creative, and more different. Mm-hmm. More not as strictly like Southern as this maybe things before, but are traditional fine dining kind of places. I think you know, Automatic Slims and Beauty Shop to me are similar to like when Hog and Hominy emerged in terms of. Bringing high end creative, like chef driven food, but in a funkier, more relaxed environment. Sure. And that mix of sort of the high and low and the the high, the mix of high and low feel you have in a place. I, I think when Hog and Hominy first opened, like that was a big thing for, in Memphis. But I think Karen Carey, that's what sort of she had already been doing, similar kind of thing. She had. You're right. And and Beauty Shop is, you know, that is definitely, well, Automatic Slims was that way too. Yeah. But then, um, you know, I think we were all surprised when she sold it, which I think was 2008, maybe. Yeah, right. she opened Beauty Shop in 2002, sold that in 2008. Uh, to another woman restaurateur, Sandy Robertson, who has Alfred's on Bill and Dyer's on Bill, too. Um, but you, there, you look, though, I mean, Beauty Shop is always crowded. Always. Right. So is Hog and Hominy. People like this. Obviously, it's, it's, a, it's something that works. There, there's an element of creativity and mm-hmm. fun and accessibility. You feel like, you know, you're eating high end, like creative, like, you know, but you're eating it in a way that you feel like anyone could walk in. And, you know, it doesn't feel like, you know, you got to put on your best jacket and sit at the white tablecloth table. It's, there's a funky creativity there. Um, you know, along with like higher end food that I, I think is appealing to people. Do you see people dress up for dinner anymore anywhere? Well, that's a good question. I, I don't. I I personally don't 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 go to high end places that often because you know I, I it takes money and I got kids and I, I'm sort of in that that in between where I don't do that as much. 
No, I mean, my my version of dressing up at this point is like darker jeans with a sports <laughs> coat. Like that's me dressing up. Yeah. That's about as dressy as, as it gets. I don't think there's a place in Memphis where you can't dress that way. Right. I can't think of any restaurant where you have to dress up or where a jacket is required for men or where you know, a woman can go in right. a pair of jeans. I mean, you wouldn't want to go in your tattiest pair of jeans, but I mean, I've, I've certainly – Eating dinner, I, I mean, I, I'm pretty much I live in jeans in blue jeans. So I mean, I've eaten dinner everywhere that I've gone in right. jeans. I'm sure, and I mean, even you know, even like Earlings. I mean, it's not you don't yeah, dress up for. I it, guess I'm not, we I, just don't do that. Yeah, I, that's more that's more precise. I guess you're right about that. But I do think there's a difference in feel of places in terms of looseness. There's just a different feel of a, at a beauty shop, a Karen Carrier kind of place. Oh, totally different than than, than there is at. at even if the higher end places are not as as um, sort of stuffy or whatever as they once were a generation ago, it's still a different kind of feel than a beauty shop kind of feel. Yeah, I wonder if Capitol Grill has a um, has a dress code. That might be a, one right. place where men may have to wear jackets, but I really don't think so. I don't think there's anywhere. I could be wrong. I'm going to find. Right. I'm going to get the answer to that. I'll, we'll we'll talk about that another time. We know you don't have a dress code at food trucks, and this, <sighs> this m- is queue is something that. I got to tell you, I'm really interested in that. You know, I, that's not – that kind of food is not always going to be my favorite, but that interests me. It was an extremely pleasant surprise because I had seen – so so this, this food truck I wrote about this week, um, the food truck is called Dynamic Duo. It's really – it's not even a truck. They call it a cart, which is probably the best way to explain it. You could call it a kiosk, a trailer. It's a little like like the size of this table we're sitting at that, you know, it doesn't drive by itself. You got to haul it and park it, and then there's, there's only space for one person inside, which is usually – this woman, Stephanie Fing, who I talked to, she and her husband um, do it. Her husband is is a manager at the Half Shell in East Memphis, and she had been a server at Rizzo's here downtown. And they had had the idea of doing this, but it's when Rizzo's closed that provoked her to finally take action. She was a server at Rizzo. She got laid off when mm-hmm. it closed, as you reported earlier this year. And that's where we got her going. And so I had, you know, they, they debuted in May, and it's probably – Right around then or shortly thereafter, I just happened upon them at the farmer's market, the downtown farmer's market one morning. It's a very colorful, like hand-painted, like attractive, you know, little booth. So I said, okay, I'll check this out. And I walked up and this was a morning where the fuel food truck was not there and they were the only food thing there. Mm -hmm. So they were just getting smashed. And so I walked up and and, and who, who turned out to be her husband, I didn't know at the time. And I just walked up to order and he said, come back in about 20 minutes. We're just so backed up. And so I, I didn't come back. I, I was at the market. I was shopping. Sure. But I sort of made a mental note. So I came back to it a couple of weeks ago. And so my assumption when I saw I saw the truck was that it was basically going to be Memphis barbecue and a burrito, which that, that sounds good, too. That sounds fine. We, we, we sounds, make, like, sounds like Elwood's. Yeah. We turn right. everything into barbecue in Memphis. Right. Like whatever, like salads, you know, spaghetti, pizza, you, you, nachos. You got it. We'll, 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 we'll make it barbecue. So I thought it was just going to be Memphis barbecue burrito. Sounds good. But that's not what it is. It is a blend, even though they call it the Memphis AF Burrito, it's really a blend of Memphis and Houston, which is where this woman is from. And so the sauce, she calls a mole cue. It's basically a mole sauce with a couple variations to, to tilt it a little bit more towards barbecue. There's molasses in there that sweetens so it up a little sweetness. bit. Yeah. And then there's some other ingredients she didn't, she wouldn't say that that sort of take a traditional mole and tilt it just a little bit towards a barbecue sauce. And so the sauce is great. And she makes her own. She roasts her own uh, roast poblano peppers and makes a poblano queso, which is also in it. Oh, yum! And it's just it's packed with flavor. Um, you know, she roasts her own pork at home with cherry wood pork, and so it's packed with flavor. And it has this nice blend of sort of Memphis style and sort of Texas style display flavors going on. And really, one of the best food truck things I've had in Memphis, I think. So, do you think that if I were to say, is this more like barbecue or more like Mexican food? Would can you classify it one or the other? To me, it tips a little bit more in in the Tex Mex vein, w- which I appreciate. Mm, me too. But it doesn't tilt all the way. It is, you know, it's slow roasted pork. It's not carnitas. It's more like barbecue style pork, and the sauce is somewhere in between. It's not. It is a little bit sweeter, you know, than, than you, a typical mole, and so it's a nice it's a nice balance between a mole sauce and a barbecue sauce. The when, 
And if you get the spicy, it is legit spicy. Well, yeah, you, that's what you said. And when you said that it wasn't, that would be too spicy for me, I'm pretty sure. You know, I just don't yeah, have that tolerance. See, yeah, I you're used down to have. on spicy food right now. So, yeah, I'm probably down so. on it. It's just, it's down, it's, it's on, down me, on you. Right, right. right. It just it hits my mouth and it hurts. Right. And this has never happened in my life. So, I don't, I don't know if that's a post COVID thing right. or if it, you know, what it is, but maybe it'll, I'll recover. Yeah, but I'm it, not putting habaneros in my mouth. Yeah, right now. no, the, their spicy is legit spicy. It's not overwhelming at all. I like, I like the spicy, but it is. Is, it, it, it's it's a real it's a real heat. Hmm. Yeah, you know when you talk about the about how we'll put barbecue on anything and barbecue it's spaghetti. Like a challenge. What can we come up with? Right, but you know, with I can barbecue, come up with stuff I don't want, but I'm surprised people haven't done. Like I'm surprised no one has made a barbecue ice cream, like a barbecue sauce based ice cream. I don't want that. I'm surprised no one's done it for a while. Someone's doing a barbecue beer in town. You That's, remember this? No, well, I didn't want that either. But either. somebody was doing it. There was some bar that had a. Somehow barbecue sauce was related oh, to the Oh, they beer. had the barbecue uh, Bloody Mary sauce, too. Uh, right. Ted that, Pearson that, had that. Yeah. But I didn't like it. Right. I mean, I liked him, but I didn't like that barbecue. Right, right. You know, smoky Bloody Mary. I don't It was bacony or right. barbecue or something. But the difference between, you said that, I mean, she's blending it. She's fusing it. And she's got a good fusion cuisine. Yeah, she calls on. it mole Q, and, and so it, it it is truth in advertising. It is a blend of the two styles. This is why I like the barbecue spaghetti at barbecue shop, but I don't like it anywhere else. Same. Is because you it is a real marinara or, you know, a real red sauce that's that's going on. They're cooking it like you would an Italian gravy, then adding the barbecue, smoking it on the pit. But it's not just well, barbecue sauce. And they're sauce. using the pasta. It's not just poured onto oh, the top absolutely. of a plain pasta. In some places, that's all it is. Right. It's barbecue sauce In most places, I think that's really all it is. I know. So why would anyone like that? You're, you're getting a barbecue shop. You're getting the sauce and the flavor infused in the pasta, which is what, you know, higher end Italian places. That's the whole point of you want, you know, just pour stuff on top of the pasta. You toss in the pasta and it sort of gets into the pasta itself. And it sounds just delicious at this moment. I haven't had that in so long. I, that's something that needs to go back on my something. I it can't put it on a never have I ever, but I could put it on a I haven't in a long time list. I have not had that in a while either. I did have spaghetti for dinner last night and, and to get to to tap into something that I wrote about a few weeks ago. I got pasta from Tamboli's at the mm-hmm. market, and mm-hmm. I got the spaghetti sauce from Jones Orchard at the market, and two great things go great together. That's what I had for dinner last night. The, so, now, do you do anything to that Jones sauce? No, I, I well, I picked a few leaves of basil from my our own mm-hmm. basil pot and added that at the end, but otherwise, no. I didn't cook much at all last week. I, I did cook a little bit. I'm trying to think, what did I do that was any good? I ate. Um, you know, this and that. I made a really nice salad. You, I, I don't know if you would remember her, but I've got a recipe coming up for her from her this week that somebody had requested. <clears throat> her name is Paula Namchef, and she owned uh, a place in Cooper Young called Sweet, which was a dessert shop. This was back 12 to 15 years ago, maybe. I don't remember this. It, yeah, it, it, she was only open for a couple of years, but it, it was really good. It was very good. Um, stuff that she would have. She did this candy bacon everyone loved and made really good biscuits. I mean, just a lot of uh, stuff. And somebody wanted, uh, had a recipe request. So when I got it from her yesterday, I just asked her yesterday if I could get it so I'd know if I needed to find something else this week. And she sent me this salad and she said, just try this um, because it's, you'll just love it. Oh my God, it was so good. It was just, you know, green olives, uh, Kalamata olives, Artichoke hearts, feta cheese, some onion, um, champagne wine vinegar or champagne vinegar. Mine was tarragon vinegar. Olive oil. There was something else that went in there. I, we did put some uh, some orzo in there because we, we made it into a pasta salad. Right. And um, feta cheese. It just combined it. You know, so, uh, some seasoning, but not much. But she used sage in it. But I didn't have any dried sage because, you know, yeah, I have to... Every time I have to have sage, it's only for Thanksgiving, and usually I can't find it. I have to grow a little in the garden or whatever. But I could, it, I didn't use the sage, but it was so good, and I did put some basil from the garden in it. Well, now that I'm mostly done traveling for the year, now that all of our summer stuff is over and the kids go back to school next week, yay! I'm going to try to get, yes, yay, I'm going to try to get back into the groove of doing like real cooking, not just like cooking because we got to eat, but like cooking for, for, for hobby cooking on, mm-hmm. on Sundays. And so I got that kicked off this past weekend, and I made, I made a, a big uh, panzanella, simple panzanella, I love um, panzanella with, with tomatoes from the farmers market. Y'all made fun of my cornbread salad, but you like the panzanella. 
there's no there was no mayonnaise in my panzanella. <laughs> I, ba- I made a I made a big panzanella, simple panzanella, and I made adobo style chicken wings. These, these were both recipes that were in the summer issue of Savor magazine that I'd picked up at um, Laura Wood Booksellers and flipping through lots of recipes I want to try out. So that's why I tried out two, and that's what I did. I did the adobo chicken wings and the summer panzanella. Well, I wanted to uh, surprise you with this, and the, yeah, I'm going. So here we go. When you just mentioned Savor magazine, I wanted to ask you some of the questions. We started something today with the story about Karen Carrier. I uh, just called ten quick questions, which we'll use from time to time as we do profiles or whatever. And different questions for different people, but I wanted to ask you some of these questions. Uh-oh. What is your favorite cookbook of all time? Do you know? I don't. I'm not a. We we have a we have a, a shelf in our kitchen for food related books, food and gardening related books, including cookbooks. I don't. There's no cookbook I dote on as like a work of literature kind of thing. Now my mm-hmm. wife got me. Um, the Edna Lewis um, country, I forget what it's called, but a taste of country cooking. Right. And my intent was to like Julie, Julie and Julia, that thing and cook sure. through over the course of a year. But it starts in spring and the Grizzlies playoffs mess me up. So I'm setting aside and next spring I plan to do this. Um, you know, the cookbooks we go, we we do a folder. We have a binder of recipes that, 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 that mm-hmm. we can sort of our own personal like cookbook we put together. And so, like, you know, there's an Indian cookbook. The I'm going to mispronounce her name, um, Joffrey. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Madhur Joffrey. Joffrey yeah, we use that. We we've cooked out of that a lot. We have a lot, several Mark Bittman cookbooks we, we use. Those are the ones we use Those are the most good. frequently. Yeah, yeah, his, all of his are good. I I still think the most important cookbook to me, and it's in my kitchen. I mean, it's not. There were the Silver Palette cookbooks, the original and the right. the second one, the Good Times cookbook. So the the first one and the second one there were plenty that were to follow that i kept even when i got rid of almost all my cookbooks i kept that whole series but that good times cookbook particularly because it's all about entertaining and doing you know dinner parties and appetizers and the kind of food that is just fun to make to me right so that i don't know that it's the best cookbook of my life but it's the one that definitely was the most important one I, I I would just I would read that book. I oh, remember. the other one that we use a lot, and I don't know who wrote it. Um, maybe you know, maybe this you're familiar or not. There's a cookbook called Essentials of Italian Cooking. That's uh, Marcella Hazan. Had, mm-hmm. Marcella Hazan. We use that a lot. And so, if you go look, if you you can look at a shelf and see which which cookbooks are the most worn and like have stains on the pages, and like if you look at our at our cookbook shelf, you would see the Joffrey Indian Cookbook and the Marcella Hazan Italian. As cookbooks that have clearly been used a lot. That, um, I just made something from a, uh, a, a Marcella Hazan cookbook. Just, but it, it was on Food 52. I didn't right. get it from the cookbook. But what's it called? Well, there's a recipe. Crocata, maybe? It was it was boiled sugar and slivered almonds. Oh, and that you, sounds good. You, oh, and you just turn it, and it turned into candies. But it was a very dark brittle. The and one you, we make all the time out of that book, and we've made it last lately now that we've discovered this good sauce that Jones Orchard is doing. But there's a, a simple pasta sauce that's basically just like canned whole tomatoes and onion, like not diced onion, but like just cut it in half, like big chunks of onion and butter that you just sort of slow cook and, and toss with pasta. And that's in that cookbook. I mean, that's a that's a, 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 a regular sort of weeknight quick meal. For well, us. you know, I think that's one of the things that she's known for is yeah. putting butter in the tomato sauce. Right. That that's a. That oh, and was, I did. When you mentioned that, I docked her up. I actually did. When, in addition to a little bit of basil, I put just a, like a quarter stick of butter and melted in the, the sauce. Oh, I did do that. I think that butter. Makes most things better. Maybe right. not everything, right. but most things better. Are, they're going to be better with butter. And um, well, that was one of those things. I mean, not a cookbook, but like everyone else, I, you know, the, the Anthony Bourdain Kitchen Confidential was a big book for me. And that's one of the things you remember out of that book was he, the chapter on like how fine dining actually works. And it was like, why does the food taste so good? Because <laughs> butter. 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 There, another cookbook that this, and this is just a small, it's a tiny little paperback book, probably 100 pages. Um, that's a James Beard. I think it's, it might be James Beard on hors d'oeuvres or, okay. but this is, I have this somewhere. I know I'd, I've never gotten rid of this one <clears throat> because it, it like, there's a part of the book that tells you about the planning of your cocktail party. It was written in the 40s, 
and you are to allow enough liquor for 13 drinks per person. Oh, wow. <laughs> I mean, I know that this is true. Those people weren't fooling around. I know I don't misremember this. No, they owe everything. I mean, there was massive amounts of, of alcohol involved in the parties, lots of butter, lots of salt, <clears throat> lots of cream. It's a wonder that any of them lived, you know, to... to to 50, uh, much less you know, to have to have lived full lives. Right. But he even talks about, you know, like how uh, moderating alcohol and it, it's just hilarious to think that this is, you're moderating alcohol, but you're talking about, I know it can't have been 13, but I swear I remember that that way. I'm going to find that also. That's a, on my mental uh, list to find that and read that aloud someday on the podcast. Um, okay. So, what is your favorite drink? I don't know if I have a set answer to that. I, I tend towards – I like cocktails more than wine and beer when I'm going out. Particularly, I tend I tend towards bourbon whiskey-based drinks mm-hmm. more than other, other liquors. Um, I don't drink a lot of alcohol at home. It's more – you know, sometimes we may have some canned cocktails in the house that's a quick pour or whatever. I like a good crisp ginger ale. I don't like I it too syrupy. I don't like mm-hmm. it too heavily ginger. I like a good crisp. And so the, the brand I like now is the Boylan, B-O-Y-L-A-N, which you can get at um, Fresh Market Fresh Mark, in particular. Right. I like that over over my good ice. I have my ice maker in the kitchen we've talked oh, about. Oh, that's right. I like that over my good ice with a, with a half lime squeezed in to give it a little bit more citrus. That 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 I love. Simple. I would, well, I like ginger ale a lot. But now yeah. I'm I'm – very, I like uh, Fever Tree. Is I'm just a I'm a big Fever Tree fan, so I have a lot of Fever Tree everything. Is that, that's the brand, mm-hmm. okay. And so I mean, if you, from everything, the different kind of tonics to the ginger right. ale to the you know the grapefruit sodas, all those little things. They're, they're small bottles too. They're seven ounce bottles, so you get the. They have those at Target, right? I think I bought that before. <laughs> they, maybe I'm maybe I'm confusing with another brand. They might have them at Target. I don't know. Uh, they have them at Fresh Market, or they did. I buy them by the case. I buy them at um, – usually if I'm getting them, I'll – Yes, that is them. what I'm thinking of. Okay. I, I've, I've seen that at Target before. They have – and like the uh, the Indian tonic, the Mediterranean tonic, I like to use those as mixers. But the ginger ale also is really nice. I also like, though, there's – if just with my bourbon, I want Schweppes ginger ale. That's what when I have of the mass market ginger mm-hmm. ales, Schweppes By is far. the best. Absolutely, absolutely better than Canada Dry. Oh, yes. better than Seagram's. Schweppes oh. is the best. Yes, of those. yes. And Seagram's would be second, and then Canada Dry. Now, Schweppes. When I talk about a crisp, Schweppes mm-hmm. has a crispness to it that is different from like from those other brands. Yeah, I do, and it's not real gingery, but you know I keep candied ginger too, and I've right. made ginger ale, but now I've never fermented ginger ale because you can make it where you actually put you know you, you put the ginger, the sugar. They used to do right. that at Life Kitchen, and it, sometimes you'd go in and it would be this. You know, great ginger ale, and it would taste like ginger ale. And sometimes it would just like clear your sinuses yeah. like wasabi because it's not something that's not that what you I can... want. And some of the ginger beers you'll buy, some of the, like the quote unquote nicer ginger beers, are a little too much like that. I don't want that strong of a flavor. Yeah, and some ginger beer I don't like um, as much as ginger, just ginger ale. Right. I don't know, I, and I'm not really sure what the distinction would be between the two. I don't. I mean, right offhand, I don't. I did try one. Um, that was supposed to be like the original ginger ale for mixing with bourbon. Right. It's called A Late One. A Late One. How does it? I know what you're talking about. A Late One. Yeah, yeah I know yeah, what you're talking about. But it, I didn't like that. I didn't either. Yeah. Me either. So I've, I've had a lot of disappointments there. People love Verner's or Vernon's. I didn't like that at I all. I didn't like that as much either. Yeah. Yeah. No, the, the Boylan, if you haven't had that, I'll try that I think one. that's very good. And, and mass market reads, Schweppes. Reads, I like. But it's expensive, too. Reads is a little too gingery for it, me, it, I think. I like it. I think it's okay. It doesn't have too much ginger for me, but it does. I think it's a little pricey. Although, Fever Tree is pretty pricey, too. But right. I just keep it away from um, the kids who really don't have any particular fondness for ginger ale, as far as I know. They just like little bottles. Right. So, I mean, they're like miniature bottles. And probably better to start with little bottles than big bottles. That's okay with me. But from a cocktail standpoint, like, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm a little frou-frou. I, I like if there if there's like a blackberry bramble kind of thing on a menu, I'm probably getting that. Yeah. I like blackberry. I like peach. I like stuff like that with like whiskeys and bourbons. 
but nothing wrong with any of no, that. No. I mean, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm, I do have my here's my, my my the rube coming out of me. I really like drinks on the rocks. And sometimes on drink menus, you won't it won't quite be able to tell. And I'm always disappointed if I order a cocktail and it comes out, it's more of a martini kind of thing and not a like on the rocks kind of thing. Listen, here's what you did, because I do it too. I'll ask for it, serve it up, but bring me a glass of right. ice. And the reason why is I'm not going to drink that martini fast enough for it to be that cold. Now, there are some places, but it's usually like at right. Houston's or J. Alexander, some kind of chain where they'll have, you know, in a tiny little carafe, they'll have your extra martini over here in a cup of ice, like a brandy snifter. And so you can keep your drink cold. It's very nice. I right. love that service, but it doesn't happen everywhere. But I'm not... I don't mind drinking it up, but I prefer it on ice, too. And I will tell you this. When Karen and I were talking yesterday about her questions, and um, she does the same thing I do. She said that she will – she has Pinot Noir every day, but she said, and I put ice in it. And I said, I put ice in my red wine, too. And the reason I do is because it's always served way too warm around here. And well, le- I mean, unless you're getting it at a restaurant that is bringing it out at the right temperature – or you have it at home. But room temperature here is too warm. You My mother be... will be glad to hear that. She, <laughs> she does that too. Well, she doesn't need to pour it over a glass. You know, I like right. a whole glass. Of, but I put ice in it and right. the, the right temperature. And that's what it is. We have run out of time. Well, but... we'll, we'll have to revisit some of these other quick questions down the line. Yes, we will. And we'll have to, you know, we have to come up with different questions for every person. So we'll uh, we'll we'll do that. And Anyway, it's good to catch back up. Glad you're back. Glad to be back myself. In-depth journalism in the Memphis community, The Daily Memphian is of Memphis, not just in Memphis, and seeks to tell the stories of this city. TheDailyMemphian.com. Truth in place.